Hello everyone, my name is Rick Jenkins. I am the Standard Plans Publication Engineer in the Roadway Design Office. Today I will cover the changes that were made to FDM 210.4.6, which is the audible and vibratory treatments for arterials and collectors in the 2023 FDOT Design Manual. Let's start with a brief summary of the revisions to FDM 210.4.6 regarding audible and vibratory treatments. We've streamlined the criteria based on our experience and the results of noise studies performed by the State Materials Office. Ground-in sinusoidal rumble strips are now the standard for all flexible pavements. Profile thermoplastic is now the standard for rigid pavements only. The State Roadway Design Office is currently planning the test project for a ground-in sinusoidal pattern on rigid pavements. The goal is to move towards the ground-in sinusoidal rumble strips for all conditions. To use profile thermoplastic on flexible pavement, it must be requested and approval from the State Roadway Design Engineer is required. The threshold for requirement remains flush shoulder roadways with posted speeds of 50 miles per hour or greater. However, we get this question a lot and it can be used for lower speeds and curbed conditions, but it's not required at this time. There is some data with the State Safety Office that is being looked at that may extend that criteria in certain contexts, but for now it remains the same. It can be used in other conditions where warranted, and there's lane departure crashes that show that it may be needed. So do not exclude it just because the FDM doesn't say to use it in that situation. If you think it's the right solution, it can be used. These revisions were released through Roadway Design Bulletin 22-04 which is available on our website now. These revisions have also been incorporated into the 2023 FDM and the 2023-2024 standard plans. The reason for the bulletin was so that the districts could use it at their discretion on current projects. And that it was needed to support the statewide rumble strip initiative that is currently in the design phase. A few highlights from the bulletin are as follows. FDM 210.4.6 has been completely rewritten. FDM 210-7 has been deleted because it's no longer needed as it showed various conditions with different types of configurations. But we only have one now and the standard plan has been updated so the exhibit is no longer necessary. FDM 230.3.1.2 was deleted as it was in the pavement marking chapter and discussed when to use profile thermoplastic. That is not necessarily a pavement marking type, so it's not encouraged for use other than when it's specified in FDM 210. Limited access is now separate from arterials and collectors. Previously, we had everything in one standard plans index. Now, index 546.010 is only for limited access, and the new index 546.020 is for arterials and collectors. One reason we did this is because we didn't want there to be any confusion on the notes regarding the limited access application in arterials and collectors, and we felt it was best to go ahead and separate it at this point. Pay item 701-18, which is for profile thermoplastic for asphalt surfaces, has been blocked. Although if it's needed, it could be reopened with approval from the State Roadway Design Engineer. And lastly, pay item 546-72-2, ground in rumble strips, 8-inch cylindrical, has been removed as is no longer an option.
I do want to go over a few things about profile thermoplastic. It was determined over the last several years of use that it is the least durable option that we have. It's also the least effective option that we have. Creates more noise pollution than the sinusoidal grounding pattern. And the materials and profiles are very inconsistent. As you can see from the photos we have taken from several example projects. These are the results from a noise study that we performed back in 2018. A little background about this. In 2015, we released our initial very aggressive design, which was the half inch cylindrical pattern. Upon release and installation on the roadways, we received a lot of noise complaints, but we knew that this was the most effective countermeasure for lane departures. So we did not want to stop installing them. But instead, we tried some different solutions to combat the noise pollution. So we had a test section in District 2 that we worked with the District 2 office and the State Materials office. And we also had an environmental consultant that we hired to do some wayside measurements. We tried various patterns. We tried reduced depth, cylindrical patterns. We tried for the first time ever a couple of sinusoidal patterns and of course some profile thermoplastic patterns. What you see here in the graph, the control section is basically a tire on smooth pavement. The parabolic is basically the cylindrical pattern. These were just the terms that we use. It's kind of like a crosswalk with terminologies. The sinusoidal pattern is, of course, sinusoidal, and the audible was the profile thermoplastic. So we had different things we measured. We measured the internal, which is the noise inside the cab that the drivers would hear. That's the green bars. The OSBI are the red bars. The OSBI is the device that the state materials office has set up with a van with a microphone directly adjacent to the tire about two inches above the pavement service. So that data you get with that noise is very consistent. It doesn't really depend on the ambient noise from other vehicles. The wayside is the purple bars. It is where you have a tripod set up 25 feet off the edge of pavement. And that is very dependent on ambient noise and noise from the other vehicles and is very expensive, time consuming effort and we wanted to develop some data correlation between the OSBI and the wayside measurements. Okay, so these red lines represent the sinusoidal pattern data, so we can see how everything else compares to the sinusoidal pattern. So looking at the internal noise, we can see that the internal noise based on the sinusoidal pattern is much higher than the tire or smooth pavement and it's also much higher than the profile thermoplastic. Now it's also comparable to various types of parabolic pattern that we tested. You could say it's in the middle. So it provides a very similar warning inside the vehicle to that of the parabolic pattern, but it's a lot quieter on the outside. All right, so now this line is looking at the OSBI measurements, comparing the sinusoidal to the profile thermoplastic, we can see that the exterior noise is less than that of the profile thermoplastic. The noise is less than the cylindrical parabolic pattern, and it's not much higher at all than the tire on a smooth pavement. Now we can see with the wayside measurement that we get a very similar outcome. So we kind of validated that the OSBI is the way we want to go. It's a lot quicker and we're able to use that in a future test that we'll see later on.
So we recently performed noise tests on various types of sinusoidal patterns. We've gained a lot of experience over the years with these patterns and gained more confidence in the sinusoidal pattern. That experience was analyzed to determine what dimensions were best for use. So detail one was the sinusoidal pattern that was implemented in 2018. Then detail two was a deeper pattern. Detail three was the same depth, but had different spacing of the sinusoidal wavelength. Tapered designs and some non-tapered designs were experimented with in testing. The data between the two was very similar. It was not much of a benefit to use the tapered over the non-tapered. And the tapered took up a lot more room on the pavement. So it was decided that it was more beneficial to stay with the non-tapered design as the standard moving forward. Here's a photo from one of the tests that we did. This is the taper design that we're showing. The reason I show this picture is because you can see the sinusoidal pattern with the taper design. It is not the standard, but I wanted to show it because it can be hard to see the sinusoidal pattern from photos. We ground it in the shoulder and then we ground it in line with the edge line. So we had all the various types of installations here. These are the results from our recent tests that show the noise data. This is an average cabin noise. If you're looking at it from the perspective of the driver, you can see that the blue bars are the decibel levels or the sinusoidal rumble strips that were tested. The black line across the graph is the decibel level you get when you're driving in the vehicle or just regular road noise. When you impact the sinusoidal pattern, the decibel level increases drastically. The red line is the decibel level increase inside the vehicle when impacting the profile thermoplastic. As you can see, you do get benefit from the profile thermoplastic, but the benefit from the sinusoidal is much greater. Now let's look at the exterior noise. The graph here on the right shows the results of the OBSI testing. The blue bars are the sinusoidal rumble strips. Black bar is the tire on smooth pavement. So you can see a very small increase in noise level outside the vehicle. You can see, however, that the profile thermoplastic has a much greater noise outside the vehicle. So you get more noise outside the vehicle with profile thermoplastic, less actual warning or benefit so it's not as effective. And we also know from our experiences that it's not as durable. So that's why we selected the sinusoidal pattern as our standard. Now let's look at the FDM 210 criteria. This new criteria is streamlined because in the past we would use specific patterns and so on. Now we're very confident in the fact that the sinusoidal pattern doesn't have much noise pollution. That is now the standard everywhere, and therefore we do not have to worry about eliminating it with the residential areas. So with the confidence in the sinusoidal pattern, the cylindrical pattern is no longer allowed. We've developed a new standard plans index associated with the new criteria using sinusoidal ground in rumble strips on flexible pavements. Currently, we're not ready to move forward with using it on rigid pavements. So our current policy is to use profile thermoplastic on rigid pavements. There may be more to come on that in the future. Like I mentioned earlier, the State Roadway Design Office is planning on doing some testing to make sure that the method used to grind on the concrete won't deteriorate the concrete surface. The criteria says, otherwise use of profile thermoplastic for any project, including triple R, 
permits, push button safety, and reshrapping projects must be approved by the state roadway design engineer. So you can use it, but we want to know in the central office where you think you might need it, and maybe in the future have certain scenarios where it's allowed. However, we are confident and hopeful that we addressed all the situations and that's not going to be the case. Okay, here is our new index 546020. Uh, this was added to our standard plans. And you can see that the only pattern shown here is the sinusoidal pattern. This contains all the information needed by the contractor except for the stationing. The sinusoidal pattern has been revised based on our recent testing and the tolerance and depths have been established. The table here has new dimensions for the depths and there's a tolerance of plus or minus 1 16th of an inch. You can also see that dimension A is 1 16th. The reason we did that is because we had a lot of discussions with the contractors and the grinding contractor said that it's critical to engage that grinding drum continually with the asphalt. So they didn't want the grinding drum to lift off of the asphalt. So we provided a 1 16th inch depth with a plus or minus 1 16th inch tolerance. So it could be exactly flush at the high point or it could be at most 1 8th inch down in the high point. But the dimension from A to B is one half inch for this new pattern. Here is sheet two of the new index 546020. You can see the locations of the ground in rumble strip associated with the shoulders and the center line. It is all detailed within the index. Each of these scenarios are described so that the contractor will know exactly when to use each scenario. Therefore, the plan callouts have been simplified with only stationing or mileposts being required. Here are some of the items I wanted to point out. This detail in the top left corner is for use inside the buffered bike lane. This condition may be used in speeds lower than 50 mile per hour posted speed. It actually was incorporated on some projects at the request of bicyclists, but again, it's not required. There's also some transition areas where the posted speed will actually be 50 miles per hour. And where we, ha we would have a buffered bike lane there, so it may be useful in those conditions. Now here in this detail is where we have the outside paved shoulder width greater than or equal to five feet or inside paved shoulder width greater than or equal to one foot. The goal here is to warn drivers as soon as they leave the travelway. We all know that our travelway starts two inches outside of the stripe. But a lot of drivers hug the line when they are on the curves, etc. So we do not want to warn them when they're still in the travelway. But as soon as they leave the travelway, we want them to be alerted. However, we do have conditions where the shoulders are less than five feet. And we made a commitment to the Florida Bicycle Association to provide a minimum four foot clear space in the shoulders so that the bicycle can ride uninterrupted. Therefore, in that case, we move it where the grinding would be in line with the pavement marking. Also new this year, we've added a detail where the outside or inside paved shoulder width is equal to zero. So basically there is no shoulder. You can see a slight difference in the alignment of the grinding. We align the outside edge of the grinding with the outside edge of the pavement marking to provide a couple of inches so we don't grind too close to the edge of pavement. This scenario is specifically to accommodate our local agencies or our off system roads that may or may not have shoulders. Most of our FDOT facilities now have paved shoulders, so this won't apply to those facilities. 
We've also made some clarifications on the center line grinding, where there is one direction passing center line and two direction passing center line and a two direction no passing center line and how to handle those conditions. Okay, that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, please reach out to the Roadway Design Office. Dave Amato is our technical expert on ground in rumble strips, profile thermoplastic, pavement markings, etc. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Dave or myself and we'll find the answers. Thank you and have a great day.